did O.J. Simpson kill his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ronald Goldman? Despite a mountain of evidence against him at this point in the trial, millions of Americans still doubt it. But is this doubt reasonable? That's what O.J. Simpson's defense team is trying to prove, and the jury will have to decide. Hello, I'm Lou Waters. The prosecution has laid out its case in the O.J. Simpson double murder trial. The government says the NFL Hall of Famer committed the murders in a calculated act of jealousy. They point to Simpson's history of domestic abuse, the fact he has no alibi at the time of the killings, a pair of bloody gloves, one found at the crime scene, the other outside Simpson's home. And perhaps most important, a trail of blood leading from the murder scene to Simpson's Ford Bronco, to his estate. DNA tests indicate that blood belongs to the murder victims and O.J. Simpson. Potentially damning evidence, but all circumstantial. The prosecution has no murder weapon, no clear motive, and no eyewitness placing Simpson at the scene of the crime. And there's another formidable obstacle. O.J. Simpson has used his fortune to hire the best lawyers money can buy. the defense, Johnny Cochran, who's also representing Michael Jackson, Robert Shapiro, who defended Marlon Brando's son, Christian, Alan Dershowitz, who won an acquittal for Klaus von Bülow, and F. Lee Bailey, best known for defending Patty Hearst. These are just some of the all-star attorneys O.J. Simpson is hired to get him out of jail. They're called the Dream Team. But right before the trial opens, a high-profile power struggle threatens to turn the dream into a nightmare. In an argument over press leak, Shapiro refers to his former mentor, Bailey, as a snake. Bailey responds, calling Shapiro petty. It's only after a group prayer session led by the Reverend Rosie Greer that a reunified defense emerges from the L.A. courthouse. How close was this dream team to breaking up? Well, the dream team is never going to break up. Uh, hopefully, we just talked about how that hopefully when this case is over, we want to remain friends forever. The fact that we've had differences uh, in the way things were presented or should be presented are behind us. We all have one thing in common. We believe in O.J. Simpson. We believe in his innocence. July 10th, 1995. After 92 days of prosecution testimony, O.J. Simpson's defense team finally gets to present its case to the jury. They start by trying to repair the damage done to their client's reputation. Your Honor, the first witness that the defense will call is Ms. Arnell Simpson. Right, O.J. Simpson, Simpson's please. firstborn is first up for the defense. Oh. Warm <laughs> smiles between yeah. father and daughter yeah. show jurors a different O.J. Simpson. Simpson. Yes, and am. everyone yeah, quickly is form. reminded like this is no ordinary yeah. murder suspect. What is your date of birth? 12-4-68. Something unusual about that particular date? Um, I was born the same day my dad won the Heisman Trophy. Simpson's sisters, Carmelita and Shirley, also will take the stand, as will his mother, Eunice. All of the family members wear yellow in solidarity. All describe the defendant as a loving and caring father, brother, and son. The lawyers take their relatives back to that awful June day, the day after Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman were killed. He was um, very motionless. His, he was numb. He was quiet, just sitting on the couch. He was holding my grandmother's hand. Gripping each other. All right. You were gripping each other? And how was he gripping you or holding you? Very tightly. Did he seem upset to you? Oh, he seemed very upset. Shocked. He was devastated. He was crying. It was, it was sad. It was just so sad. He was... Shock, days, uh, it was, he was just there. Simpson's family paints the first sympathetic picture of the defendant thus far, and Eunice Simpson describes a family medical condition that will come up again later in the trial. What is that condition? Rheumatoid arthritis. Do other members of your family have that condition? Yes. What other members have that condition? My father, my, sis my two sisters, 
and Carmelita. All right, what about O.J. Simpson? O.J. most of all. The Simpsons also were on hand to undermine the testimony of prosecution witness Ron Shipp. Shipp, an ex-cop and longtime Simpson friend, was at the estate the day after the murders, consoling his friend. Shipp says while they were alone in O.J.'s bedroom, Simpson made a startling admission that he dreamed about killing Nicole. You also mentioned that there was a uh, man named Ron Shipp who was there. Yes. Where did you see him when you were in uh, the downstairs area of the home? Uh, he was sitting at the bar area. You doing anything at the bar while sitting there? Yes. What was that? Yeah, he was having a drink. His eyes were glassy. Um, he was muttering to himself and basically like talking in circles. He appeared to be space. What was that word again? Well, he... Space, did you say? I would say space. Ron Shipp did come up to the bedroom. I was in the bedroom. I was sitting on the couch. He said a few words to me, and then he left the room, and he never returned to that room again. So you are absolutely certain at no time did your brother speak privately to Ron Shipp in the bedroom that night? I'm absolutely certain, yes. Despite the strong start, the defense loses a significant battle on opening day. Judge Lance Ito rules a letter from Nicole to O.J. Simpson, written a year before the murders, is inadmissible. Part of it reads, I'm the one who was controlling. O.J., I want to come home. I want us all to be together again. We can move wherever you want. We can stay here. I just never want to leave your side again. The Dream Team argues the letter undermines the testimony from prosecution witnesses who said O.J. Simpson was consumed by rage and jealousy toward his ex-wife. The lawyers do manage to make the same point less powerfully through two additional witnesses. Oh, next witness, please. One, a songwriter named Carol Connors, describes an encounter with the defendant and his new girlfriend, Paula Barbieri, at a fundraiser the night before the murders. How did they seem together? Well, I happened to witness, or I happened to see, a very exquisite romantic moment that took place between the two of them. And being a writer, I was able to compute it into my brain and to understand it and to wish that I had been lucky enough to be in a situation of what I had watched. Connors later describes that moment to reporters, saying Simpson was stroking Barbieri's face while Natalie Cole sang the song Unforgettable on stage. The other witness is interior designer Mary Collins, who's known Simpson for 20 years. She testifies she met with Mr. Simpson and Paula Barbieri at his Rockingham estate six days before the murders to discuss renovating the bedroom. Now, you mentioned that Paula Barbieri was also present during this meeting. Mm -hmm. Did she participate yes. at all in this 45-minute discussion regarding what was going to happen to the location there? Yes, she did. And how did she participate? She uh, was looking at samples of the choices I brought, and uh, they were discussing with each other which they preferred, and uh, they seemed to be agreeing pretty much on the same things. It's a good first day for O.J. Simpson. The defense depicts him as a loving father, a devoted son, a man looking forward to a happy future with Miss Barbieri. It's quite a contrast to the last five months in which O.J. Simpson was described as a menacing, controlling ex-husband prone to violence. All right, next witness. Next, a parade of so-called demeanor witnesses take the stand to testify how the defendant looked and acted before and after the murders. First is executive Jack McKay. He played golf with O.J. Simpson in Virginia a few days before the killings. He was a very um, cordial, friendly, uh, very willing to shake hands, sign autographs. Very much different, I would say, than other celebrities that I've had an occasion to play golf with. But in a harsh cross-examination, Marsha Clark points out the golf tournament was sponsored by Hertz, Simpson's employer. She says as a spokesman, Simpson was only doing his job by acting cordial. And she suggests he had a more sinister reason for turning on the charm. If someone was planning to commit murder, sir, 
Would you expect him to come to you if he wanted to get away with it and grumble sustained. about the person he wanted to sustained. kill? Sustained. 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 Okay, do you know how someone oh, would act? Excuse me, hold on. Curious to disregard the implication of that question. Two couriers who saw Simpson at the L.A. airport the night of the killings testify they were dazzled by the football star's presence and graciousness. Uh, would you describe his demeanor to the jury? He just, I mean, he just was like smooth, just, you know, hey, just walking through like, I'm O.J. Did he, <laughs> did he appear to be rushed in any way? No. Did he appear to be distracted in any way? No. Did he appear to be preoccupied in any way? No. What was his demeanor? How did he look at that point to you? Just kind of calm and just taking his time. And when you approached him, what did you say to him? I said, um, hey, Juice, can I get an autograph? And uh, when you said that to him, what did he say, if anything? He said, sure, just let me get my luggage situated. Captain Wayne Stansfield provides a sharp contrast to the laid-back couriers. An American Airlines pilot, he flew O.J. Simpson to Chicago the night of the murders. Stansfield testifies he got up to stretch his legs at 2.45 a.m. and found Simpson wide awake. Simpson autographs the captain's logbook, writing, O.J. Simpson, peace to you. When you were seated next to Mr. Simpson uh, that night, Captain, and he was writing in your book, did you see both of his hands? Yes. Did you see any bandages or injuries that caught your attention? No, sir, I didn't register on that at all. Remember, the prosecution says Simpson cut his hand committing the murders, but Simpson maintains he cut it in Chicago on a broken glass. Stephen Valerie, a business school student, sat right across the aisle from Simpson on that flight, and he says he paid particular attention to Simpson's hands. I viewed Mr. Simpson's hand specifically um, looking for a championship ring, uh, given his fame as a professional football player. Um, that was the motivation for my looking at his hands. Um, I didn't see anything unusual, no band-aids, no large abrasions or, or anything um, to that effect. When O.J. Simpson lands in Chicago, he's met by Hertz employee, Jim Merrill. Merrill describes Simpson as being cordial and friendly despite the early morning hour. But a short time later, Merrill receives three frantic calls from Simpson, who's just been told of the murders. What was his demeanor during the third call? Well, the third call uh, was probably the most desperate. Um, How so? Well, he, he um, I, had, I was, at this point I was very concerned. Um, I, hadn't, I had no idea what had happened. Um, so I asked the question, what had happened? I told him I was very concerned. In cross-examination, Marsha Clark points out that O.J. Simpson is an actor by trade. You have no way of knowing whether the frantic and desperate manner in which he behaved was an act or for real, do you? Oh, well, I have no way of knowing. While Simpson is waiting for Merrill to pick him up and take him to the airport, He's spotted by Hertz executive Dave Kilduff. Kilduff immediately notices Simpson's bandaged hand. When I, Mr. Simpson was sitting against the, the, the wall, it was very sunny. I could actually see into the bandage because it was loose and it was very bloody. I could see the entire gauze area covered in blood. This bolsters Simpson's claim he cut his hand in Chicago. Mark Partridge, a copyright attorney, was Simpson's seatmate on the flight back to L.A. He says he quickly realized the football star had suffered a personal tragedy. Well, he, he sat next to me. Uh, he had... Um, he sighed heavily and uh, look, looked up, closed his eyes. As Partridge testifies, O.J. Simpson becomes visibly upset and seems to wipe away tears. The demeanor witnesses help Simpson for the most part. After the week's testimony, one legal analyst writes, either O.J. Simpson is a better actor than we realize, or his distress was sincere. Friends, family members, and others have vouched for O.J. Simpson's good character and his demeanor before and after the killings. Now a parade of Nicole Brown Simpson's neighbors takes center stage to dispute the prosecution's carefully laid out timeline theory. 
To do this, we return to the night of the murders and the scene of the crime. O.J. Simpson has no alibi between 9.35 p.m. when he returns from McDonald's with Kato Kalin until 10.55 when he emerges from his house to rush to the airport saying he'd overslept. The prosecution says Simpson committed the murders during that window of opportunity. In fact, they pinpoint 10.15 p.m. as the time of the killings because that's when Nicole's neighbors report hearing barking dogs. But... The defense says they can prove the murders took place almost half an hour later than 10.15 at about 10.40. Let the record reflect, we've now been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. To do this, the Dream Team calls an unlikely pair. I was on a first date and I picked up Ellen Aronson. We had a date once. <laughs> so <laughs> Danny Mandel and Ellen Aronson were on a blind date the night of the murders. They went to Mezzaluna, the same restaurant where Ron Goldman worked, and Nicole Brown Simpson had her last meal. What time did you leave the restaurant? Approximately 10.15. And did you refresh your memory in some way uh, to get that time? Yes, I did. And how did you refresh your memory? Well, by when I looked at the credit card receipt and the time stamp on it. The pair then walked back to Aronson's house. Along the way, they passed directly by 875 South Bundy, Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium. How long did it take, if you know, from the restaurant to 875 South Bundy? It took us 15 minutes. That puts them within 50 feet of the murder scene at about 10.30 that night. A time, the prosecution says, was punctuated by barking dogs and general pandemonium. When you walked by that area, did you notice anything unusual? No. Did you hear anything unusual? No. Did you hear any barking dogs? None. The news reports were saying that there was a dog barking, that there were lights on a Bronco. Uh, I think they said the hazards were on, the lights were blinking. At the point that I was at that street, on the street, there was nothing. It was an extremely quiet evening, out of a movie. The next witness is Francesca Harmon, a hotel manager who was attending a dinner party just up the street from Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium. And what time did you leave the dinner party? 10.15. Harmon says it was 10.20 by the time she got in her car, removed the club anti-theft device, and drove past 875 South Bundy. Did you hear the sound of a barking dog? No, I did not. Did you hear the wailing of a dog? No, I did not. Denise Pilnack lives a few houses down the street from Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium. A self-professed distance runner, she relishes her role as a witness for the defense timeline. I am a stickler with time. I don't go anywhere without two watches when it's important. For the record, you have, a, you have two watches on today? Yeah, my running watch, which is very accurate, and my other watch, which isn't. <laughs> Pilnack testifies that when she walked her friend to her car at 10.25, she didn't hear any barking dogs. In fact, she goes even further. That Sunday evening, it was exceptionally quiet. As long as I've lived in that home, I never remember a night when it was absolutely still. There wasn't a sound to be heard. Her friend, Judy Tielander, backs her up. It was very quiet. In fact, Denise and I had commented when we walked out to my car about how quiet and it was that kind of misty kind of L.A. evening where um, almost like a Halloween night and I think I made a comment or she did that it was almost eerie it was so quiet and you wear two watches is that right not always if I'm in a rush you know, on cross-examination Marsha Clark points out that in her original statement to police Pilnack's time estimates were off by an hour and she tries to demonstrate this stickler for time isn't reliable by asking when exactly she arrived at the courthouse this morning. Um, I arrived about 10.15, 10.30. And you were wearing two watches? Well, when my first watch wasn't working real well, so I just wanted to make sure with time. So was it 10.15 or was it 10.30? I didn't look at what time I arrived today. Despite that, the Dream Team has saved what it considers the best for last. All right, who is your next witness? Robert Heidstra, Your Honor. All right. 
Robert Heidstra, another neighbor, may be the only ear witness to the crime. He says he was walking his dogs in the neighborhood about 10.40 that night when... All of a sudden I heard two voices. All right, you heard two voices? Yeah. All right, and what did you hear these two voices say? Well, the first one I heard was a clear male young adult voice that said, Hey, hey, hey. Heidstra points out his location at the time in an alleyway just behind Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium. At the time you hear this uh, sound, hey, 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 what happens after that, Mr. Heidstra? I heard another voice uh, fast talking back to him, to the person who said, hey, hey, hey. Did you hear what the other voice said? <laughs> Could never hear the dogs were barking so, much, so loud, it wasn't, couldn't hear nothing. After the exchange, Heidstra says he hears a metal gate slam and then nothing but barking dogs. Heidstra's later testimony will prove a double-edged sword for the defense, but for now, the day's witnesses are damaging to the prosecution, and members of the Dream Team leave court in a jubilant mood. The prosecution started out by saying that um, the time of death was 10.15. By all accounts, we listen to these witnesses today, time of death couldn't be until after 10.35. I think it's curious that the prosecution has interviewed all of these witnesses. We found out who they were through information that we were given from the prosecutors. So this is not new. An unasked and certainly unanswered question hangs in the courtroom at the end of this busy day. Could O.J. Simpson commit two brutal homicides, dispose of the murder weapon in bloody clothes, and get home and clean up in time to meet a limo in at most 20 minutes? Jurors take note of the Dream Team's no-nonsense approach. The defense has put 22 witnesses on the stand in the first week. But after the mostly successful character, demeanor, and timeline testimony, things start falling apart for Team Simpson, as one witness after another backfires. Uh, Remember you know Robert Heidstra? It was, uh, hey, 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 three times. The neighbor's ear witness account helped push back the time of the murders, which helped the defense. But later testimony proves a boon for the prosecution. That's because five minutes after hearing voices near Nicole Brown Simpson's condo, Heidstra says he saw a car, a lot like O.J. Simpson's, speeding away from the scene of the crime. Deputy District Attorney Christopher Darden asked Heidstra about a conversation he had with an acquaintance several days later. Did you tell Patricia that the vehicle resembled a Ford Bronco? I, I told that it was like a wagon, a wagon car, a big, big, like a Jeep. Excuse me, Mr. Heidstra. Heidstra's tentative demeanor seems to annoy Judge Ito, who repeatedly instructs the witness to speak up. Finish asking the question before you start your answer. Pull the microphone close to you, please. Thank you. Heidstra causes more courtroom consternation when he's questioned about the second voice he heard on the night of the murders. The second voice that you heard sounded like the voice of a black man, was that correct? Yeah. Sustained. Sustained. Of course not, wait, I don't. Wait! But this statement about whether somebody sounds black or white is racist, and I resent it, and that's why I stood an objective. And I think it's totally improper. In America, at this time, in 1995, we have to hear this and endure this. This is the witness's statement, and if the statement is racist, then he is the racist, not me. Okay? I, I didn't say and clearly, said. well, wait, well wait. I mean, but that's what you're suggesting, and that's what, you know, has created a lot of problems for my family and myself, statements that you make about me and race, Mr. Clark. Well, you should and stop doing these to the court. Wait, Sorry. wait. I'm going to take a recess right now, because I'm so mad at both of you guys. I'm about to hold both of you in contempt. We'll take 15. If I see this conduct again from either of you two... When things cool down, Heidstra finally is asked the key question. Mr. Heidstra, didn't you tell Patricia Barrett that the voice that you heard was the voice of the defendants? Never ever said that. Didn't you tell Patricia Barrett Quote, I know it was O.J., it had to be him, unquote. <laughs> no, I never said that. Absurd. Absurd. Legal analysts praised Darden's cross of Hydra, saying the rattled defense witness hurt O.J. Simpson at least as much as he helped. It's a trend destined to continue. Although he looked like Tarzan, you know, he was walking more like Tarzan's uh, 
grandfather. Dr. Robert Heisinger was hired by one of his patients, attorney Robert Shapiro, to examine O.J. Simpson two days after the murders. On the stand, the former team doctor for the L.A. Raiders says Simpson presented all the symptoms of post-NFL injury syndromes. Well, he was visibly limping to my eye, and uh, my initial impression was that it was mainly the osteoarthritis or the wear and tear disease. I think that really he is limited, specifically lower extremities, by his arthritis. Using a series of photographs he took during the examination, the doctor says Simpson showed no signs of a fight to the death struggle with two young adults. Well, initially I was looking over uh, every part of his head, including his scalp, for any evidence of hematomas, which is a, uh, after you get some direct trauma, a little bleeding under the skin, any bump. We were looking very carefully for scratch marks. I was looking for any area of a chipped tooth and ran my fingers uh, around all of his uh, teeth in his mouth. I did a very careful physical exam of his nose. Uh, I do that routinely uh, looking for any evidence of the use of cocaine and his uh, nasal passages were entirely normal. Looked very carefully on his neck for any evidence of pulling or tugging or any bruise. Would you describe your findings to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please? On the 15th, there was no evidence of any trauma or bruising or uh, any evidence of recent trauma. Heisinger adds, in his professional opinion, the cuts on Simpson's finger and hand probably were caused by broken glass, not a knife. I just wanted to ask you... I hope he's not hurting the doctor. Not in the slightest. Am I, doctor? <laughs> no. But in a memorable cross-examination, prosecutor Brian Kelberg turns the tables on the defense using their own witness in a theatrical show against them. Doctor, in your opinion, could he then with his right hand holding a knife slit her throat? Did he have the strength in his hand to do that? Given a stationary hypothetical, as you have said, yes, I believe that that would be possible. And what we're going to start with is what we call easy impact. It's athletic, it's physical, and there's no dancing. Kelberg also wants to show the jury this videotape, made two and a half weeks before the murders. I got one two tape, that little knee problem. That's no problem, no shame here. As it's played in court, Simpson is heard repeatedly complaining about his knee. But it's an offhand joke about wife beating that Kelberg really wants the jury to hear. Now, OJ, I warn you, you come near me, man, this left hand. I'm telling you. Got to get your space in if you're working out with the wife, if you know what I mean. You could always blame it on uh, working out. <laughs> now, everybody laughs in the video because this video was made before the murders. If this video had been shown the day after or had been shot the day after the murders and Mr. Simpson made the very same remark, to that trainer that he makes in this video, I don't think there's one person who's exercising with Mr. Simpson or one person who would watch that video who would be laughing along with Mr. Simpson. The court will recall that this was said with a smile on Mr. Simpson's face, that the people who heard the remark were chuckling at it, that it was clearly a remark made in jest. It was taken in jest. Now this works the middle section of the shoulder. Judge Ito decides to let the raw footage of the video speak for itself. When the wife beating joke comes up, only one juror seems to pay particular attention and takes notes. Next up for the defense, Richard Walsh, the exercise instructor who hosted the video O.J. Simpson, Minimum Maintenance for Men. On direct examination, he testifies to Simpson's physical limitations. I thought he was too physically limited to... Uh be the co-host with me. And why did you think that? Because I knew the type of tape that, we're, that I was making needed, you know, not somebody real, real physically fit, but it needed someone who had the ability to at least be mobile laterally, forward and back. But on cross, he too proves a double-edged sword. Christopher Darden points out Simpson kept pace with people half his age and ended up working a 15-hour day. And I have to admit, I was amazed that a man in, uh, was able to do it. I looked, I said, how did you able to do that? So he was dead set on stopping after the first round, and that's when he made that comment. The comment being that it's like game day. It's like game day. 
Thank you very much. Outside the court, the Dream Team's reversals of fortune are getting plenty of attention. Commentators speculate O.J. Simpson will have to take the stand himself to avoid being convicted. Nevertheless, defense lawyers still have plenty of tricks up their sleeves as they move on to tackle the scientific evidence against their client. We had a great day. The prosecution's case relies in part on a trail of blood, a trail they say that leads to O.J. Simpson's guilt. The defense claims the trail leads to sloppy police work, bad science, and perhaps something more sinister. Do you have an opinion on whether, based on those chromatograms, there is EDTA present in the stain from the back gate? In my opinion, yes. It demonstrates that there is EDTA present in that stain. EDTA is a preservative. According to forensic toxicologist Frederick Readers, it's present in two blood stains, one found at the scene of the crime, the other on O.J. Simpson's socks. Why would those stains contain a preservative? The defense offers an explanation. The day after the murders, O.J. Simpson willingly gave a sample of his blood to police. It was stored in test tubes containing EDTA. The defense says someone in the LAPD must have taken blood from one of the test tubes and planted it. But the prosecution points out, readers didn't do any experiments on the blood stains himself. And the investigator who did, FBI Special Agent Roger Martz, directly contradicts readers. I concluded based on the work that I'd done on the 19th, the 22nd, and the 28th, that the blood stains in question did not come from preserved blood. They did not come from blood that was preserved with EDTA. And there's another complication. EDTA also is found in everyday products like food and laundry detergent. If the blood on the sock found in O.J. Simpson's house contains EDTA, could it have come from detergent? Dr. Readers says no. Did Agent Martz of the FBI uh, test an area of the sock that did not have any apparent blood on it? Yes, did that's that what he states he did. Did that indicate the presence of EDTA? No, it did not. And what does that tell you about the blood stain? Well, that means, since it is my opinion that the, the blood stain contained EDTA, that that came from the blood and not from the sock. If jurors aren't buying the planted evidence theory, the defense has another, contaminated evidence. John Gerdes, a molecular biologist, offers this sweeping indictment of the facility where most of the evidence was tested. The LAPD laboratory has a substantial contamination problem that is persistent and uh, substantial. Is it chronic? It is chronic, and it's chronic in the sense that it uh, doesn't go away. I can find it month after month, and uh, it persists. Gerdes conducted an independent investigation of the crime lab's procedures and performance. He found half to all of the tests performed there have problems. I found uh, that the specimen handling procedures uh, were done in such a manner that it had a tremendous, there was a tremendous risk of, of the potential of that cross-contamination. The prosecution counters pointing out not all the tests were performed by the LAPD. Blood samples also were sent to two outside laboratories, Cellmark Diagnostics and the State Justice Department. Tests performed at these labs also point to Simpson as the prime suspect. The defense now returns to the scene of the crime, using forensic science to attack the prosecution's timeline theory. Their witness, Dr. Michael Botten, brings impressive credentials. Besides investigating the deaths of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, Jr., he helped convict the man who killed civil rights leader Medgar Evers. Today, he testifies about the brutal deaths of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. What is the basis for your opinion that there was a struggle between Nicole Brown Simpson and her assailant or assailants prior to the time she died? Well, because there were about... Uh nine or ten stab wounds and cut wounds on her body before she suffered the fatal uh, injury. The point of all this is to show the murders took a lot longer to commit than the two or three minutes granted by the prosecution. 
If the defense can show the murders took 5, 10, or 15 minutes, O.J. Simpson's window of opportunity closes. Remember, according to the limo driver, Simpson was back at his estate at 10.55 that night. If Ronald Goldman began a struggle with his assailants at 10.40 p.m., Within a reasonable degree of medical certainty, can you tell us when the stab wound to the chest would have occurred? My opinion would be at least five minutes, uh, more likely around ten minutes after the neck started to bleed. Your Honor, the defense calls Dr. Henry Lee. Finally. The internationally renowned forensic scientist, Dr. Henry Lee, takes center stage for the defense. Hired by Robert Shapiro right after the murders, Lee is considered the nation's top forensic investigator, credited with solving 5,000 crimes. He's also famous for his courtroom theatrics. Dr. Lee's tutorial style and obvious expertise hold the jurors' rapt attention, and his testimony isn't always grim. Was Mr. Blazier there? Leaving, Your Honor. Sustain. Oh, maybe him. I, you all look alike. I don't know. <laughs> but the defense has a serious reason for putting Lee on the stand to explain three sets of mysterious parallel lines found at the crime scene. The defense suggests they're the shoe prints of a second killer. The prosecution says that's nonsense, and the only detectable footprints are those from a pair of Bruno Mali shoes, which they contend Simpson wore when he committed the murders. Lee's testimony is cautious. If this parallel line imprint comes from a shoe, could it be the Bruno Magli shoe? No. It would be some other shoe. If this is a shoe print, this is a different type of design than Bruno Magli. But Lee never says definitively the lines are shoe prints. And a couple of weeks after appearing in court, Lee holds a news conference to announce he'll no longer testify for the defense. One time experience, it more than enough. Life have to go on besides O.J. Simpson case. It's a sentiment members of the jury probably share. The D-180 typing result consistent with Mr. Simpson. The jury has been overwhelmed with scientific evidence. Can you see that the moisture has spread out from the control swatch? Those samples are contaminated. And by scientists. Now the jury must decide whose experts and which science has revealed the truth. While lawyers argue in court, the Dream Team gets an unexpected gift. Tapes of Detective Mark Furman talking to a would-be screenwriter have come to the attention of F. Lee Bailey's lead investigator. On the tapes, the man who found the bloody glove at Simpson's estate turns out to be a racist, rogue cop. He repeatedly uses the N-word to describe blacks, despite specifically denying he'd done so under oath. He brags about police brutality, evidence tampering, and lying under oath. He even insults Judge Lance Ito's wife, since she once was his superior. When Johnny Cochran wins a protracted legal battle to get a hold of those tapes, the prosecution launches an all-out war to keep them out of court. The episode threatens to bring the trial to a screeching halt and emotions to the breaking point. This is a blockbuster. This is a bombshell. This is perhaps the biggest thing that's happened in any case in this country in this decade. Why are the Furman tapes so important? Despite vehemently denying race has anything to do with their strategies, both sides are well aware that nine of the 12 jurors are black. Furman's repeated use of the N-word on the tapes, plus his general tales of police thuggery, could inflame passions in the jury box. What we vouch for in terms of Detective Furman, in terms of everyone in this case, is that no one planted any evidence at any time there has been no false statement made about where that evidence was found, the analysis of the evidence, or its results. And the defense wants to squirm away from that fact by playing the race card. She talks a lot about this, this idea of a race card. And we take personal umbrage to that. Because, as this court knows, credibility is the key of every case. And so, Judge, this is about credibility. It's not about race. I happen to be black. He happens to be black. These men happen to be white. What difference does that make? We're all still Americans. 
The question is, in this case, credibility and whether or not this man has lied under oath, which the tapes will show that he has. Are we all fools? Do they take us all for morons? The debate infuriates members of Ron Goldman's family. They hold a press conference to accuse defense lawyers of throwing up a smokescreen. Ron and Nicole were butchered by their client. Do any of you believe otherwise? You have seen the evidence in this trial. It is overwhelming. This is not now the Furman trial. This is a trial about the man that murdered my son. As emotions near the boiling point, the case takes another bizarre twist. That, uh, their review of these tapes indicate that uh, Mr. Furman uh, apparently has made comments that are disparaging of this court's spouse, uh, Captain Margaret York of the Los Angeles Police Department. Captain York once was Furman's supervisor. Fighting tooth and nail to keep the tapes out of court, and some say scuttle the case, Marsha Clark suggests York may be called as a material witness. If that happens, Judge Ito would have to step down from the case near certain grounds for a mistrial. What we suggest to the court is this is a ploy by the prosecution, because they don't want to proceed further. We will never agree to a mistrial in this case. This man has committed perjury. There's no need to dance around this. He has committed perjury, and that's the issue. Your wife has nothing to do with that at all. We want to end this case, Your Honor. We want to get a verdict from this jury. We don't want a mistrial. We want a verdict that's based on the evidence. We want a fair and just verdict. In these tapes, Mark Furman indicates, I am the key witness in the trial of the century. If I go down, the prosecution's case go down. It goes down, and he says, bye-bye. And that's what they're faced with. Bye bye. They see their case floating out the window. No matter what you do, no matter what you do, Judge, you will be criticized because there is an appearance created and you, it's a no win situation. Well, that's pretty much par for every day, isn't it? Yes, I agree. At the end of this emotional day, even Judge Ito seems on the verge of tears as he sends the issue of whether his wife can be a material witness to another court. I will love my wife dearly. And um, <clears throat> I am wounded by criticism of her, as any spouse would be. And I think it is reasonable to assume uh, that that could have some impact. In a couple of days, Judge John Reed rules Captain York is not relevant to the proceedings and the prosecution cannot call her as a witness. Meanwhile, Judge Ito already is studying transcripts of the tapes with the insults against his wife edited out. But before he rules on the tape's admissibility, there's another explosion in the courtroom as Robert Shapiro accuses Christopher Darden of threatening the judge in chambers. He then, however, got to the heart of the matter. He said, Judge, I haven't vented in a long time and I'd like to vent. We think you've been unfair with us. We think you've been unfair to the prosecution. It started with Mr. Kelberg. You cut Mr. Kelberg off. You allowed Mr. Cochran six days of cross-examination and you would not allow Mr. Kelberg cross-examination. You embarrassed Mr. Kelberg. You ridiculed him in front of the jury and we don't like that. You also continue to do that the next day with Miss Clark. You cut her off. You vilified her in front of the jury. We don't like that. And that was the reason that they had threatened this recusal against you. Mr. Cochran made certain comments that what the prosecution did warranted being referred to the state bar for unethical conduct. And that is going to be our intention for an investigation as to whether or not they have attempted to obstruct justice in chambers by putting you in an uncomfortable and untenable position that you have been unfair personally to Ms. Clark 
and unfair personally to Mr. Kelberg. We find that reprehensible. Your Honor, I'm so offended at Mr. Shapiro's remarks, remarks that I'm sure that are being fed to him by Mr. Cochran. But I'm so offended by those remarks that I would rather not stand at the same podium at which he stood a few moments ago. The issue here is whether this defendant killed Nicole Brown or Ron Goldman or not. The issue here isn't my ethics. The issue here isn't racism. The issue here isn't Detective Furman. And it isn't their egos and how much money they can make or how many talk shows they can appear on. This case is a circus, and they've made it a circus. And I know that you've tried to do everything you could to prevent that. And so have we. Now, if Mr. Shapiro and Mr. Cochran want to refer me to the state bar, fine. Because when this case is over, I'm going to be referring to Fitz attorneys to the United States Attorney's Office. And he chuckles now. But will he be chuckling later on? It won't be so funny later on. They don't know everything that I know. It's an all-time low for participants in the case, but some observers suggest Judge Ito intentionally is letting each side blow off some steam while he ponders the most difficult decision of the trial thus far. Should the jury get to hear the Furman tapes? The answer to that question will have to wait. Judge Ito does let the public hear the tapes as they are played in open court during arguments without jurors present. As advertised, the content is sickening. One thing is abundantly clear from the tapes. Mark Furman perjured himself earlier in the trial while testifying for the prosecution. March 15th, 1995. And you say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman. That's what I'm saying, sir. So that anyone who comes to this court and quotes you as using that word in dealing with African Americans would be a liar, would they not, Detective Furman? Yes, they would. All of them, correct? All of them. But the tapes prove otherwise. All told, Furman used the N-word 41 times on the recordings. He also brags about repeated instances of police brutality. No blood marks. No problem. Not even any marks. This is body service. You're trying to find a person on there. It's out the LAPD, still reeling from the Rodney King beating and L.A. riots, is suffering even more humiliation from the Furman fiasco. A year earlier, they also embraced Furman. He's uh, a highly uh, professional, competent uh, detective. He has the full support of the chief of police. Now the police department has a different opinion. I am horribly uh, sickened and upset at what I saw on the screen by the words of this retired detective, and I'm glad he's retired. But while the tapes are the subject of nationwide debate, the jury still hasn't heard them. Judge Ito takes a day off to study the tapes, decide on the matter, and draft a definitive ruling. Finally, he announces his decision. The jury will get to hear two brief snippets of the tapes, demonstrating Furman has used the N-word in the last 10 years. They will not get to hear the other 39 instances of Furman using that word or his braggadocious ramblings about police brutality. All of the world knows who this person is, but now our jury won't. I think the judge is very, very weak. He, he didn't show no, 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 no kind of justice. I think the jury only needs to hear it once to know that Mark Furman is a racist. Once you say the N-word, nigger, I mean, we pretty much know where you stand. Judge Ejo's decision smells of corruption, cover-up, underscore cover-up, racism, disrespect of, for all morally decent people in this city and in this country. Jurors who've languished in isolation for days as the lawyers maneuvered finally get to hear the sound bites Ito has selected. Although these comments are tame compared to the rest of the tape, this is the first the sequestered jurors have heard about Detective Furman's racism. Several are visibly upset as the tapes are played in court. 
but there's more to come. Judge Ito lets the defense call an assortment of witnesses to add a hateful exclamation mark to the tapes. He said if I had my way, I'd gather all the niggers would be gathered together and burned. He said the only good nigger is a dead nigger. Officer Furman turned around, looked at me, and told me, I told you we'd get you nigger. Kathleen Bell, Natalie Singer, and Roderick Hodge all crossed paths with Detective Furman in the previous 10 years all vividly recall their encounters. Was, nobody ever said that to me before. I heard the N-word before, but uh, nobody ever said something like that to me before. Finally, Furman himself is led into court under tight security. Demonstrators march outside. Some proclaim Simpson's innocence. The jury isn't present when he's questioned by defense attorney Gerald Ullman. Detective Furman, uh was the testimony that you gave at the preliminary hearing in this case completely truthful? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Uh, Detective Furman, did you plant or manufacture any evidence in this case? I assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. As Furman leaves the court, O.J. Simpson is seen wiping away tears. What more does anyone need out there to understand that we have now demonstrated this man had motive, he had opportunity, and now he's claimed the Fifth Amendment out of his own mouths. But jurors won't get to see Detective Furman repeat his performance. To explain his absence, Judge Ito proposes to tell the jury this. Detective Mark Furman is not available for further testimony as a witness in this case. His unavailability for further testimony both on cross-examination, excuse me, on cross-examination is a factor which you may consider in evaluating his credibility as a witness. A higher court tells Judge Ito he cannot give the jury the order, and the defense loses its attempt to reinstate the instruction in the California Supreme Court. The trial drags on another week to the juror's obvious dismay. Now, counsel, I realize that we're all tired and we wish this were over sooner than later, but this kind of petty bickering is not appropriate. And if you heard the snickering of the jurors as they were going out, they thought it was pretty silly, too. You know, it's amazing to me. It's astonishing what we've sunk to here. That we have to argue over waxing and waning. We have to argue over, and the waxing and waning goes to this side. The syringe goes to this side. This is incredible. This is just incredible for both sides. We'll take a recess for 15 minutes. If there's not a stipulation, then we'll have some more testimony, I guess. Thank you. After refusing to rest its case during the prosecution's entire rebuttal case, the defense finally decides to throw in the towel. It's difficult to end with bangs if the judge kicks away our ammunition. But there's yes. one more piece of business. Mr. Simpson, good morning, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. As much as I would like to address some of the misrepresentations made about myself and, my, and Nicole uh, concerning our life together, I'm mindful of the mood and the stamina of this jury. Jury, I have confidence, uh, a lot more it seems than Ms. Clark has, of their integrity, and uh, that they will find, as the record stands now, that I did not, could not, and would not have committed this uh, crime. I have four kids, two kids I haven't seen in a year. They ask me every week, Dad, how much longer? All right. This trial over. All right. Thank you. All right. Mr. Simpson, you do understand your right to testify as a witness? Yes, I do. All right. And you choose to rest your case at this. All right. Thank you very much, sir. From his heart, I thought he was wonderful. I thought it was quite clear that he was speaking from the heart. That is something that was heartfelt. Prosecution should be glad O.J. Simpson didn't take the stand. He is a compelling and outstanding witness. He hasn't seen his kids in, in a year. He's seen at least two. I will never see my son again. Back in court, the moment everyone has been waiting for, Your Honor, finally, morning, is at hand. Honor, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that uh, we have no further testimony presented at this time, and as difficult as it is, the defense does rest at this point. Thank you. With those words, the testimony phase of the trial of the century finally is over. Now attorneys for both sides prepare final arguments. Everyone involved agrees the case for the defense was a real roller coaster with unexpected dips and turns no one could have predicted.
But how did it all play to the sequestered jurors, who've heard none of the ubiquitous expert analysis and spin control that shapes public perception of the case? The answer will have to wait for the verdict. I'm Lou Waters.